Welcome to the Love Talk, where we confront myths and misinformation when it comes to relationships. Where couples and singles learn to love intelligently. What happens when love and culture clash? This is what we're going to be covering today. That's today's topic. We have a couple who will share their story with us because they went through exactly that. At a certain point, their relationship, their love towards each other clashed with cultures. But before that, let's go to a very important segment of the show. Let's go for Dear Love Talk. And this is Dear Love Talk time, a segment in which we answer to your questions. If you have any questions about relationships or love life in general, send us your questions to questions at lovetalkshow.tv and we'll be more than glad to answer to your questions here in this program. You can also send it through our Facebook page and our... Website. Yes, <laughs> which is <laughs> lovetalkshow.tv. Yes, lovetalkshow.tv. This is our uh, revamped website. The website has existed for a while, but it's, it has a new face right now. Brand new now. Brand new face. So let's go into the question, into today's question. Um, I have a one-year-old daughter. Her father does not help at all, and he does not pay child support. What should I do? I'm still very much in love with him. We have been together for four months and we have separated because he is a womanizer, drinks a lot and likes to party. <laughs> well, if I'm to uh, answer in an emotional way with my heart, I would say, oh, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. But we're, gonna, we're not going to answer to our hearts with our emotions. We're going to answer no. with our reason. Because clearly, she's not using her intelligence. No. You are intelligent, but you're not using your intelligence. Because based on what you described right now, in few words, it's enough to see that um, you, you fall into a trap right there. She walked into a trap. Exactly. She didn't fall into a trap. Because you see, yeah. from, from what she wrote, she has a one-year-old daughter. They have been living together for four months, but now separated. So that means they were in that relationship for a while. She got pregnant. She had the child. The child is now one year old. And I believe four months ago, they decided, you know, let's live together. So it started all wrong. I'm sure that he didn't start partying, drinking and being a womanizer four months ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the, if he wasn't full on, you know, like at her face kind of thing. She knew, but this is what people do, look. They see signs, but in the name of love, they say, we're gonna make it work. And, you know, let's keep trying. And that's, and that's what she, she mentions in her, in her email. I'm still very much in love with him. So you're, you're, you're thinking with your heart, not with your brain. You're, you're, you're allowing your emotions to lead you. So much so that this relationship started all wrong. You, you are uh, being somehow mistreated. Your feelings completely disregarded. And yet you want to insist with this relationship. I think you need to evaluate yourself a bit more. Even before evaluating him. Because you already done that. He drinks a lot. He's a womanizer. He likes and he to likes to party. To, yeah. So you already know the kind of man he is. And he doesn't help with the child. The child at all. He's not a father. He's still behaving as a boy. Doesn't support He's the child. He's still behaving as perhaps as a very immature man. Mm -hmm. So now it's time for you to evaluate yourself. To see where you are, who you are. You know, uh, uh, what am I doing to myself? That's the question you have to ask yourself. What am I doing to myself? How am I, how am I treating myself? Mm because you are clearly giving more value to him than to yourself. And, and that's a, to herself, obviously. That's a and her child. That's a clear example of uh, women when they go into a relationship that is bad, because this relationship's bad, mm -hmm. that they say, you see, men are no good. But didn't she see back then that he wasn't, you know, uh, committed, he wasn't, 
okay, let's keep trying, let's keep trying, let's move in together. And he never paid anything, he never helped with the child, he's still drinking, he's still partying. I believe there were, there were signs. I'm sure. Pretty clear signs in the beginning sure. that he was going to become or turn up to be the man he's been, if he is a man, because so far he hasn't uh, shown any signs of being a true man. So listen, uh, dear viewer, if you want to continue down that path and, and still suffer and you know, go through all those kind of uh, humiliation and embarrassment, then it's your call. You may say, I have a child, I need a father for my child. Okay, it tr it's true, you need a father to your child. But this man is not a father. He's not even a man, so you may need one, a you may need a father for, uh, to your child, but first of all, you need a husband, a man who is gonna take care of you, take care of your child. Only wishing to have a man beside her is not enough. Only wishing to have a man or a, 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 male, a male figure, that's the word, a male figure right next to is not enough. And he's proved that, that it's not enough. So think carefully, make a wiser decision, okay? This is our advice to you to all those, and to all those who perhaps have been going through the same thing, okay? So this is our question, uh, our uh, question for today. If you wanna send us your questions, once again, questions at lovetalkshow.tv. We will answer to your questions here on this show. Hello YouTube, I am Rafa and this is Luke and we are the presenters of the Love Talk Show. And you can subscribe to this channel, like, share and leave your comments below. Welcome back to the Love Talk and today's topic is when love and culture clash. And right now we're gonna watch the story of Nathan and Caroline who had to deal with this issue. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Caroline Azier. And my name is Nathan Azier. So how was life growing up? I actually, you know, grew up in Africa till I was about 12 and then I came over here at 12 and um, yeah, but apart from that, life has just been you know, fairly normal. Get on with my mom, my dad, you know, my siblings. I was born and raised in Kenya and growing up, I did not have any siblings, but because we had such a big extended family, I had all my cousins with me. So for me, it was just a family. So and I came over here when I was 13 years old and I've been here ever since. In Nigeria, I went to a boarding school quite young and at that young age, I was, I think, nine, I think, when I went to boarding school. And at that young age, you know, I was like, my mom had already come, you know, to the UK. My dad was there, but I didn't get to see my dad often, you know, because he lived in a, a different state, you know, so uh, he lived and worked in a different state, so from where I was. So because I didn't see him, you kind of become your own, you kind of start looking after yourself, basically, you know, I mean, the first couple of things that happen, you go to people after that, you, you realize you're the only one that's got your own back. So you kind of get a, a thick skin fairly, fairly quickly. So that was my case, you know, and I think I've been like that ever since. <laughs> well, with me, on the other hand, I was raised up in a, in a lone parent household. So for me, I never knew what it was to have a father around. And that was the case for all of my cousins. So we sort of just got together and just as a big family. But coming over here, life was completely different because I didn't have any of my cousins around. My mother obviously worked, so it was different for me. Being a teenager, I was very wild. I, <laughs> I did everything, everything. But in terms of my love life, I was, very, I was always very careful. Like I never really wanted anybody to come and destroy my life because I was always raised up with strong values. So obviously, you know, I went to school, finished school, and then went to university. And in my first relationship, it was okay, but it just didn't end up very well. Every parent has expectations of their children. My mom expected me to finish school, go to university, get a career and obviously start working. And that's the sort of model I had to live up to. So I knew the relationship was not gonna help me get there. So for that reason, I had to disregard the relationships and just continue, you know, get into that model of what mom wanted me to be. On my side, love life, as a teenager, you know, you kind of, you get introduced into this stuff by friends. You know, and you know, it's either going to be a case of people mocking, and you have to prove yourself. You know, or, or you know, you start doing things, so you start to go, I start to go raving. 
you know, I started to go clubbing, you know, I only went there strictly for the girls, you know, I'll go, you know, with to a house party, for example, strictly for the girls. There was no other reason behind it, you know. But in my house, it's not something that we spoke about in my house. In my house, you don't bring up love life. I mean, I know they expected me to get married at some stage. I don't know how it was going to happen. But um, nevertheless, you know, it's just something that it's like for them, my parents just study, study, study. I remember the first person I went out with was in college. Uh, my mom didn't know about that. Probably till today she doesn't. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I think guys think this way. But for me, I, I believe that the first girl I met would be the first girl I married as well. But um, strangely, she didn't believe in marriage. Okay, I was very young to be talking about marriage, but it's just something that I thought about at the time. You know, I was 16, no, 17, something like that at the time. And, you know, but she didn't believe in marriage. She came from a single parent household. She had three sisters and or two sisters and her, and none of them, one, yeah, well, only one of them was married, and for her, like, seeing her older sibling and her mom not married, she just said to me, it's a piece of paper, that's what she said to me, you know, and at the back of my mind, marriage meant something, my mom, my mom and dad were together, so I just kind of left that, because I was young <laughs> at that stage, but it's something that I, and I, um, you know, I took into, into consideration at the time. So with my first relationship, I really took it seriously. Even though I never really thought of marriage, I never wanted to get married, I just thought, okay, you know, I'm with a person, we can have a family together. But I never actually saw me walking down the aisle. Uh, simply because I guess I didn't really grow up in that sort of um, nuclear family. So I didn't really understand what it was, you know, to have a man. I didn't understand that. So that's sort of... That was my thoughts when it came to relationship and marriage, I guess. To be honest with you, I was not looking for a partner. I was coming to work on myself to build myself up as, obviously, yeah, I was coming to build myself up. And I wasn't, I wasn't looking around thinking, you know, you know where, where can I find the next guy? So as I was working on myself, we happened to have gone to a trip to Israel. So when we went to this trip, then I saw Nathan, and then we began talking. There was no intentions behind, or you know, we we're gonna start dating. There was nothing like that. But through the conversations and through the time that we spent together, then obviously we wanted to get to know each other more, you know, start going out and stuff. And that's what we did. And I was at the age of what, 20, 26, I guess. Well, for me, um, it's probably bad advice what I'm gonna say here, but it's something I said to myself. <laughs> I said to myself that the next relationship I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna go in head first. It's either gonna break me or make me. <laughs> I know it's a stupid thing. I look back until today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pat myself on the back for that. But I said to myself, I'm gonna do that. You know, I'm not gonna go in and test the waters, put my foot in, and you know. So that's what I said to myself. Um, I wasn't actually looking for someone at that time, to be honest with you. And like you know, like my wife said, we we met on a on a, on a trip, met, you know, to Israel. You know, I went to Israel with different plans. You know, I thought, oh, finally I get to see Israel. <laughs> but um, you know, on that, you know. One of the journeys, she happened to sit next to me and we got talking. And it's like, I thought, wow. You know, and it's like, every other journey in Israel, I would look for her to sit next to her. <laughs> because it was, it, was really, it was really a good conversation. I just thought, wow, this is amazing. And it's like, it was different. You know, it's, it's the things that, I don't know, just, I can't tell you now what we spoke about. But all I know is that everything that was, I was hearing just kept me engaged. And I thought, wow, okay, this girl's really amazing. And I need to find out more about this girl and this is actually how we met. The dating period for us was, you know, fine. It was good because we, we, you know, after Israel we came back, you know, I, I you know, I let her know what I, you know, I, I, you know, I tried to get her, uh, I tried to keep, in, I know, I tried to, I made an effort to keep in contact with her. Mm -hmm. um, we dated for about three years. The three years was, you know, very good three years, you know, we'll go out, you know, catch up. To be honest with you, I really had to, make time to to see her in those three years because my schedule was very different to her schedule so you will find out only quite a few hours in a week were when mm. we got to see each other but it's like when those hours came we'd make the most of it you know doesn't mean it didn't have its struggles or difficulties but the reason why it actually took three years was more to do with family trying to get family on board not because i have any other reason but you know i i remember saying to her that people may not agree but after we get married, no one can come to us and say, you did this in the wrong way. So, you know, my plan was, look, let everybody know, let everybody know, you know, if they choose not to accept, fine, but no one can come back to me and say, oh, you rushed into it, or you didn't ask my approval, or you didn't do this, no, it's going to be a case of whatever question they have, it's going to be that because they refused, you know, so for that reason, it took a, it took a bit of a while, 
but it was all, all trying to get everybody on board basically, not only on my side, on her side as well actually. When I introduced Nathan to my family, they really liked him and I remember the times that he would come over, you know, they would really engage in conversations with my stepdad, with my mum, you know, they really, really liked him. But obviously once we got engaged, then the story changed, like completely changed. So from then on, it's like, because obviously my parents knew we were dating, they never, they probably never thought that we were going to get married. So for them, they were fine. But once things started getting serious, then obviously my mum told me where she stood with the whole relationship. She even said she was not going to come to the wedding. It was a very hard moment for us. Well, she never really said exactly what the issue was, but I just remember her saying, you know, you need to finish your studies, you need to get a job, you need to do this, you're still young, you're not ready. There was a lot of... I wouldn't say reasons behind not her accepting, but I guess it was a culture thing as well, because obviously we're from, both from different cultures. You know, he's Nigerian, I'm Kenyan, we've got our own way of doing things and he's got his own way of doing things. So that's probably what mum could not come into terms with. The first time I met Caroline's parents was quite, was different because actually we, we chose to meet her parents first because she saw that we were more accepting than my parents were. Like I said, in my house we didn't discuss this stuff. I mean, if she was Nigerian, we didn't discuss it either. Imagine her being from Kenya. I didn't know how I was going to approach that. So what happened basically, we decided to meet her parents first and she, she introduced me to her, to her mom and stepdad. And I remember her stepdad, you know, she thinks he's welcoming, but I remember him saying to me, this is going to be the beginning of a long friendship, he called it. He didn't say relationship, he said friendship. And I, for me as a man, I understood what he what was coming at. He looked me in the face and he, he let me know basically, I said, yeah, I accept this as a friendship, nothing more. So, you know, I don't know if she, she, you know, my wife seems to see a different side of it, but um, for me, that was really a wall that he put right in place right at the beginning. Well, Caroline's mom was always friendly to me. This is the thing. So, you know, for me, she was always welcoming, not an issue at all. She wasn't there probing me or asking any questions, you know, you know, not no uncomfortable questions, basically. She just accepted me. Right, you're going out with my daughter. That's fine. You're welcome here anytime. That's how Caroline's mom, you know, saw me, basically. It took about two years of, of, um, of oh, about two years basically for I introduced her to my, to my parents. My parents looked at it like they didn't want someone who's going to be a burden on their son, if you understand. So they wanted, you know, in their eyes, someone who's, you know, studied and someone who, who you know, who helped their son and so on, everything, you know. And not only just help the son, but for them, they wanted someone that, I don't know, they, I feel like they felt more comfortable who they picked. You know, first of all, they were not going to go outside of Nigeria, first of all. Within Nigeria, we were quite... We've got different tribes. It had to be from my tribe. Not only from my tribe, but it had to be someone that they approved. So it means that I could actually have brought someone from my tribe and they could say to me, no. So this is what I'm dealing with, basically. And um, now to go outside my tribe, go outside Nigeria, <laughs> to go to Kenya was not, was definitely not, was a no-no in their books. So, you know, this is, this is, this is what I, I, you know, this is what I had to overcome, basically. My parents, my grandparents are all from the same tribe. So it's kind of like, it's what they knew, it's all they knew, you know. And sometimes they had, you know, heard about people who had married outside and found it difficult. You know, at first it seems all nice, but later on, you know, things would go wrong and they, they, would, they would even say something as small as, oh, but we're at home, you can't speak in your own language, you know, you have to speak in English and you know, this and that. And, you know, and the, the way they saw it is always, you know, you get married, you kind of go away from your motherland kind of thing, or, you know, you know, they just felt like, you know, they were losing a son. So one point that I would like to highlight here, even before we go any further with Nathan and Caroline's story, is uh, this issue of uh, parents trying to dictate somehow the lives of their children. We, 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 we all know that they wish well, mm -hmm. obviously, as any, any, any parent, any mother, any father wishes their, their child well. However, they're not the ones getting married and they're not the ones who will remain married and having to keep that married, marriage mm -hmm. uh, alive, if we can say like that. So we see here that um, both uh, sets of parents wish their children the best, right? Study, work, have a career, have a career so on and so forth. But at the same time, we saw Nathan and Caroline struggling. She said she was a bit wild, <laughs> right? 
he he wanted to get married. He wanted to get married at the age of 16. <laughs> so they were completely clueless about love life, the issues of their heart. So we see here that yes, parents should always give their children uh, proper advice and guidance, but they should also understand that they have their own life to live. Unfortunately, many times, um, based on the people that talk to us about relationships, many times when a parent says, you know, you shouldn't worry about love life, shouldn't worry about love, study, mm -hmm. have a career, have, you know, work, think of that later on. Usually, not all the time, but usually it's because they have had a bad experience. So they think, this doesn't work, yeah. this love thing doesn't work, so you better stay off this, mm -hmm. focus on yourself. It, it, it might not work. And in case it doesn't work, at least you have a good career. Exactly. You have money to, to, to support you. You know, you have a good reputation because this thing of relationship of marriage may not work. Yeah. And you, you will end up getting hurt. It's that thing that we're always saying here. You can only have one or another. You can't have both. But that's not intelligent. That, in a way, is also emotions. Uh, some parents are teaching their children to make decisions based on emotions, mm -hmm. based on traumas that they themselves have had. So you see, in their case, really, although the parents advise them that way, it wasn't really working. Yeah. So um, we're going to go into a break right now. And after the break, we're going to watch the second part of Nathan and Caroline's story. OK, stay with us. Today I want to talk to all the women who feel very disappointed by men, who say men are no good, men are all the same, they are deceivers. The ones that I have had a relationship with, they used me or they deceived me. That sometimes can be true, that men are out to deceive girls, to deceive women, that they don't really love you, they don't really have any good intentions with you. But what I want to draw your attention to is, if you have been deceived more than once, why is it that a man was able to deceive you the second time around? Could it be that the mistake is only on him? Many women who come uh, to talk to us, this is one thing that I see. They complain, they like to badmouth men a lot, but they also make mistakes. They also let themselves be deceived. So my tip to you is, the next time that you are um, considering a relationship with someone, before giving your heart, before really going for that relationship, observe. Give yourself time to observe. Don't go just with anything that comes along. Because if you have been deceived more than once, if you have been deceived many times, yes, they are no good, but you are allowing yourself to be deceived. So be smarter when it comes to love. Learn to love intelligently. That's my tip for today. Until next time, again in Just Between Us. Hi, YouTube. Did you know that we hold a seminar called Love Talk Live every Thursday, 8 p.m.? That's right, at the address below that you can see, and it's completely free. We, and there we talk about similar topics yes. of the ones we talk about here on Love mm -hmm. Talk Show. You can get in touch with us by emailing us questions at lovetalkshow.tv or through our Facebook page, Love Talk Show. That's right. We'll see you there. Welcome back to the Love Talk. And today's topic is when love and culture clash. And just before the break, we're watching Nathan and Caroline's story, how they had to deal with this issue, uh, having to choose between love and culture. So let's watch now the second part of their story. I would made up my mind at this stage, now that okay, I want to be with this, you know, with Caroline, and it made it very difficult to get them on board. That's what it was. It, it just it was just an obstacle for me. That's what it was. At first, you know, it would be an, an emotional pers persuasion. And I wouldn't, it's not something I, I would want, but, you know, when your mom cries, you know, as a man, it really gets to you. And I start rethinking my actions, start thinking, is this what I want to bring to my mom? I mean, 
and this you know so it, for me it kind of manipulated me emotionally but um as time went on as time went on you know I, it got to a stage where i put my phone down and i said right you know it doesn't matter if she cries or she doesn't cry or whatever she does i'm just gonna be blank and let her know this is it this is that this is that nothing else and that's what i did i was getting frustrated as well because even though we're going out for a while, it's like, you know, as a woman, you've got certain um, expectations. For example, you get engaged, you know, you, you, you set a date for the wedding. And for me, it just felt like it was prolonging. Because fair enough, he was going through the issues at home and, and sort of knew about them, but I didn't really know to what extent. So sometimes, you know, he would be okay. And then he just, like, who, who wouldn't really speak about them? So I, as I said, I had an idea of what it was, but not too much of an idea. But I guess he was trying to protect me in a way. So there's certain things that he wouldn't tell me. So for example, if I was to go to his parents' house and then maybe afterwards, maybe his parents would talk to him about me and maybe about the relationship, he would not tell me those things because obviously he knew they would tarnish me. So he would just keep it to himself. You want to get somewhere, you know, and you're not finding the support you needed mm -hmm. to get to where you were. And as well, I had, I've got a twin sister and she had to go for exactly the same thing. Uh, the difference was, you know, <laughs> he's Nigerian. well, he's Nigerian. <laughs> That's the difference. But um, so it should have been easier, but it wasn't easier for her. And I, I saw the whole thing happen, you know. And I, I was the one that, you know, even though family members did not want to go to the to the wedding, I said I'll go. And I wasn't gonna not go because no one else in the family wanted to go. You know, for me, I've seen the guy. Nothing wrong with the guy. He's a very nice guy. You know. Why are we being around the bush for? So, but eventually, you know, it, people were convinced and they all came for the wedding. But when it came to my own, and I started hearing the same rumblings, and I didn't want to go for what they went through. I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, having to live life, you know, you, you go to work, then you go see, I go to see Caroline, then I, you know, parents, and now this extra stress. Imagine trying to get married with all this burden. It's not something that I needed. For me, I remember when you got engaged, I, um, I made sure I didn't show my mum the ring. I thought, no, I'm going to take off the ring. So as soon as I got home, I took the ring and I hid it, simply because I knew what, what her reaction would be. So I think after two weeks, then I said, oh, mum, by the way, we got engaged. She's like, oh, OK. Like, it wasn't anything exciting. So that obviously made me realise where she stood. So even coming on to, like, the wedding preparation, it was, it got really hard being in the house. So I had to leave home as well. So preparing the wedding, you know, doing the shopping, it was all just me and Nathan. <laughs> With my mum, she did want me to get married to a Kenyan person. So I remember even after we got engaged, um, there was a lady, my mum's friend, that came over and then she was saying, you know, I've got a cousin of mine, he does this, he's single, he'll look after you. And she'd always be like, oh, you know, is Nathan really serious about you? And that time we were actually just about to get married. So I thought, okay, yeah. So I did, that's what mum would have wanted me to do, to get around to a Kenyan person, maybe eventually move back to Kenya and just settle. That's what she wanted for me. You know, to be honest with you, at the stage when I got engaged, I was still, should I or should I not? That's, that's just how, how I was inside. Not because I was doubting if I should go ahead, but it's like, I'm, I have all this fight on one side. I'm plowing ahead, but it's still the doubt of, because I get engaged, my parents have to find out at some stage. Now, you know, imagine they had a problem with a relationship. Imagine now saying you're going to get married, and, you know. So all this stuff kind of, you know, weighed down on me. Um, like I said, her parents were, were, were welcome. Whenever I went there, they were still like, you know, welcoming towards me. You know, they, they, when, actually, I did go around to the parents and I looked at the, 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 her parents know that, you know, we were engaged and um, that was interesting. <laughs> I um I thought I thought and I thought it an honor to tell the parents that look I'm engaged to your daughter we're gonna get married and I was told you know actually we should not be speaking to you should be speaking to your family and I said I was like no but I know you know I'm only telling you because we get on and I just thought you speak to my family but I just want to tell you first and I was still told no we should be speaking to your family and I was like no no you don't understand I'm 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 trying to let you know that you know it's a good thing you I will get my family to speak to you but and I was told no we should speak to your family. And I thought, right, so it's a bit cold, you know, I said, here's good news, but you're making it seem like, you know, it's irrelevant, basically. Uh, that was that side. On my own side, you know, it's still, I still had the, the difficulties. I, I, I did have, you know, those, I did try to speak to them and speak to them. And even a few months before I got married, or almost a year at least, my dad, you know, kind of flew back 
you know, to Nigeria and at the airport, you know, because what I, what I did was I had a, a one-to-one talk with him and I said to him, I really sat him down and said, look, you know, you've come around and we've never spoken about this because okay, because he lives in Nigeria, he comes over and he goes, so what I did, I, I sent him a text and, you know, to let him know how, you know, things were, I didn't get a response back and when he came, you know, it's like, you could come see, but we never really spoke. So one day I sat down and said, look, we haven't really spoken about this stuff and this is important. And that day was really productive. I mean, we had a really, you know, it's almost like, you know, and because I, I think I, I kind of started it saying, I know we don't see eye to eye on this, but here's the case, you know. And, you know, he agreed and, you know, we spoke and it was very productive. And I thought, okay, we're going to have a, a part two. Hopefully it's coming around. But the day he flew off, you know, he just, on that day, it's as if we went back to minus two, basically, not even zero. You know, he just literally like, you know, I, I honestly, I, I left the airport angry, you know, upset. You know, and I thought, no, this is not it. And, you know, to be honest with you, from that day, I mean, you know, there's there's not much more I can do. I mean, I had to, I did call him close to the wedding, you know, let him know this is the thing. And I said to him, and he would say to me, what do you want, you know, from me? And I'm like, I was like, you know, I, I, it would be nice if you, you know, at least put a thumbs up for me. You know, I'm not asking you to pay for anything in a wedding. I'm not asking for now, just a, his blessing. And, um... You know, but for me, he, he just kept going on silent and he was quite frustrated. So at the end, you know, I just kind of said, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy myself on that day. I'll get married once mm -hmm. and it's going to be a blessed day. For my mother, I tried to contact her and she, she you know, she didn't want to come. I tried to send my brother an invitation. He just told me something that was not very nice, you know, but um, yeah. And on the wedding day, he didn't show up. On the wedding day, she didn't show up. On the wedding day, my dad was on the country, he didn't come. Um, so, two of my sisters did come, um, which is good. Well, after we got married, you know, I, I spoke to my mom all the way through. I didn't cut her off, you know. I, I even said to my mother, you know, and to my dad, look, no matter what happens, I'm still your son. You know, I'm not gonna go, oh, you don't want, right? I'm gonna go my way, you know, if you don't talk to me now. I didn't do that. So everything I did, I mean, like I spoke to my wife for, I said, we're gonna do it properly. You know, the worst that can happen, they can look back and say, they didn't agree, that's all they can say, but they can't say you went away and did it and this and that. So I, 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 um, I, well, after we got married, you know, my mom, you know, you know, <laughs> after we got married, she, you know, she, we, we, we spoke, you know, and, you know, she told me why she couldn't be there on the day, okay? And, you know, but after, ever since then, you know, she's actually embraced, you know, my missus as well. So, you know, it seemed like, uh, you know, it's not gonna end well, but, Especially embrace my, you know, Caroline, my wife, and you know, we. I still talk to my mom, you know, get on, you know. Me and my dad were fine as well. It's not like a, you know, it's not like right, you know, you got married. I'm gonna cut you off as well, you know. So you know, we speak, you know, when, when we speak, we speak, you know. It's not, it's not an uncomfortable conversation. Well, it didn't really affect us in any way because we had already made up our mind, and I think it's really important once you want to do something that you can hear advice. But if you make up your mind to do something, just go ahead and do it. So in my mind, I thought. I know what I want to do. You might not support me, but obviously I know what I want to do and I'm going to stick to it. So that's the kind of mindset I had. So obviously during the wedding, they did say they're not going to turn up, but two weeks later they're like, okay, we are going to come. So they actually came on board, which really helped a little bit. And yeah, and our relationship is so much better now. You know, we go to his parents' house to see his mom. He comes to my mom's house. And our relationship is so much better now. Like during, during the dating period, I had to look back and, and you know, a lot of the things that I applied are, are things that I learned as well in, 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 the, in, the, in the love love talk sessions as well. <laughs> One of the characteristics was learning that women are not men. You know, normally if a guy, if you say to a guy, you okay? And he says to you, I'm okay. He means I'm okay, I'm fine, leave me alone, you know? So before I did the Caroline, if I said, are you okay? And I said, I'm okay. Even though I see the face is sad, I'll leave it that way. I learned from the love talk that women are not like us. Sometimes you have to probe and probe what is wrong, what is wrong, and eventually they open up. So it's, it's, it's something that I learned and something that I practice and really is helped me a lot, you know, even up to today. Um, patience as well. Women, women are very different to men. <laughs> you know, they have this emotion thing going on. And um, <laughs> so, you know, I learned as well, you know, to be patient, you know, when, you know. For me, you know, if there's couples who go through like, cultural differences. First things first is that they, they for one thing I know is that I was getting married to my wife Caroline, we have to be able to stand on our own two feet. We can't depend upon person A or person B. Mm -hmm. 
because when people cannot sustain themselves then they go to that person that is that doesn't want them then they end up in a blackmail well i'm going to help you only if you leave so it wasn't none of that so you have to make sure that look i'm certain of what i want and also i can stand on my own two feet and you know you can stand on your own two feet and to be honest with you you know those who are going through this is not as bad as he's made to seem you know it's not as bad as, as far as far as you know the person that you know you're, you're, you're going out with the person that you're going to marry you know you're certain about the future you know look we have similar goals we have similar plans because all these things we spoke about before when you spoke about her goals spoke about my goals you know there's questions that were asked just to see uh, the way she thinks about stuff you know i don't know just little probing questions that she may not understand where this is coming from but i would just ask just to see how she what kind of answer she would give me you know and to be honest with you it's, it's just it's just a plan go ahead you know i think for me communication is really key and i'm the kind of person i never really knew how to communicate like i'm still it's still a learning process so for example if something was to happen my reaction is just to shut down and just not say anything but he's completely different to me so he forces me to communicate and i think in any relationship the most important thing is communicating coming to a common ground and just working it through so for me communication is the key which is what we've learned in love talk live um for me yes um <laughs> being married some of the challenges have been you know like my wife said you know if we have a disagreement she just shuts down and it's quite frustrating for me because i as a man i just want to get it discussed end of story let's move on but when she shuts down and it drags on for a few hours longer than it should basically so I, then i have to exercise patience now because it's I, there's no point snapping at her you know i'm going to be in effect hurting my own self you know indirectly so it's exercise patience you know and i keep probing and probing what is it what is it what is it you know even when i hear oh, it's nothing or whatever you know eventually it comes out what it is and you know we discuss it you know and to be honest if you if it's a small issue i make light of it even if it's an issue that's something i still make light of it <laughs> because I, i don't like to turn around and say oh but i told you no no i don't do that and mm-hmm. so i still I, i do it so that she feels comfortable as well like, okay this happen and, and normally it's a case of look we can work this out it's not a problem so the aim is to communicate and always be, for me to make her happy <laughs> <laughs> One thing that is very clear in their story is that they knew what they wanted from day one, right? They asked each other uh, questions, uh, goals, plans, what do you want? They pretty much studied each other very well. So when they went through all those things, when they went under pressure, the pressure of the parents uh, due to traditions or culture, expectations. expectations, you know, focus on your career first, as we mentioned before uh, the break, they, 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 they felt that pressure to the point where he even said, um, perhaps I, I don't know if I should continue when he was engaged. And he said, when we were engaged, I was like wondering if I should go ahead or not with this relationship. However, thinking back, he He realized that, no, wait a minute, I know who she is and, and, and we meet each other halfway. So why should we change our, our purpose and our plans just because of the pressure of my parents, of her parents, who, by the way, will not be with us for the rest of our lives, right? So this is something uh, interesting to observe that from day one, from, right from the beginning, throughout those three years, they made up their minds, they knew what they wanted, they, they took the time, which is different to, to many couples nowadays, many people go into relationships, they, they jump into a relationship, like he said in the, in the first uh, part of, the, of the, his, his story, um, I told myself I was going to go into a relationship head first, <laughs> right? So uh, that sounds cool or daring, but you know, it, it may be dangerous. Thankfully, he didn't do that, Right? Thankfully, he, he, he thought well about it and he worked things out. So when the pressure came, when the, you know, the, the whole family, both sides, they were demanding a lot from them, they had a very solid foundation uh, to stand upon. And 
one thing that is very interesting about what you said in their story is that many couples, they do something that in their minds can be similar, but it's different, where the family, it, not, it doesn't necessarily have to do with culture, but the family sees that this person, this relationship is not healthy. This person is not good, mm -hmm. and the family, yeah. you know, input, say, look, maybe you shouldn't. And couples go anyway, no, mm -hmm. I'm going to live my own life, I'm going to do, I love this person, but they are not doing what you said. They are not knowing each other, they are not certain. They are just going through their emotions. She, she, said, she put it very well, she said, we knew what we wanted, uh, regardless to people's opinions, uh, regardless to what they were telling us to do, that's what we want to do, go ahead for it. Uh, go, go ahead and do it. However, as we, you mentioned, and I mentioned before, they knew each other very well. They were not acting based on emotions, on the feelings of the heart, just going, you know, just challenging the family, you know, let's see this is a Hollywood story, you know, could make even a move out of it, let's run away. Yeah, let's just, you Just know, disappear. You see yeah. that they, they spoke to the parents, they, Nathan made sure that the father knew everything in spite of his um, desire to, you know, to oppose the relationship, which he did from the beginning. Nathan went ahead and made sure that the family knew, her family knew also. They didn't hide anything. So you see everything? That. Was well planned. Yeah. Well orchestrated, if we could say. Well thought of. Well thought of. So uh, uh, um, once again, the, the, the input of families, especially parents, are very important, obviously. However, you know, one must make sure of what he wants. Imagine Nathan and Caroline married to someone who the parents told them to get married with, without them expressing their own, um, you know, views or, you know, beliefs or desires. I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't be here talking about their relationship, where they would be probably most likely looking for help, searching for help uh, somewhere. So. Um, after the break, we're going to come up with the conclusion to today's topic. But before that, let's see the three most annoying things from Nathan and Caroline. The three most annoying things about my partner are <clears throat> when he keeps asking me, are you okay, are you okay? Sometimes I'm going to be left alone but he just overdoes it, which is sweet, but it can be a bit annoying. One of them is when she shuts down, when we have a, a disagreement. You know, she, you know it's, it's very irritating because you're trying to find the root cause of the problem. And when someone doesn't talk back to you, it's very annoying. When he eats something or drinks something and leaves the things right there where he's sitting, and I don't like that, it's quite annoying. She's a very clean person and just like, Sometimes you kind of eat a meal and you know, you just want to like put the plates in the sink and go back and carry on relaxing, but she wants to clean up straight away. And I think, come on, this is time to chill now. Let's chill and I'll leave the plates, you know, we're going to get around to that. But she feels like, no, I have to do this now. And When he takes off his socks and separates them from his clothes, so he puts the socks on the floor, <laughs> that's really annoying. So yes, those are our three most annoying things about my partner. Hi YouTube, hope you're enjoying watching our show right now. And just so you know, you also can find us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter on the details below on your screen. Make sure you follow us on there too to stay up to date. Welcome back to The Love Talk and today's topic is when love and culture clash. And we could see in Nathan's and Caroline's story that at some point, it was clashing, mm -hmm. culture was clashing because he's from one country, she's from another country and the families were pressuring them to make decisions based on their culture culture and beliefs. However, they chose love, but not just love, intelligent love. Yeah, and it can be something, we understand, it can be something very hard because nobody wants to disappoint the parents. You know, if you grow up and your parents were there to support you, you don't want to disappoint them. but. If you've chosen somebody that is for you, you know, that you have found that has the same goals, the same plans, it's unfair for you to not go with that relationship because 
it doesn't go according to what your parents expected. So you really need to use intelligent love mm -hmm. for you to decide how to proceed. Yes, and at a certain point there will be sacrifices. You, you can choose uh, uh, whether to sacrifice before by making a, a conscious decision, intelligent decision, using your reasons as they did. What was the sacrifice? Sacrificing their feelings, their emotions, uh, even the thoughts or the idea of losing their family, of upsetting their family, and sticking to each other. So today we see that they are getting along. On the other hand, you can then go with your heart, appeal to emotions, succumb to the pressure, do what others want you to do, and then in the end you're going to suffer. You sacrifice once again, but you be the one being sacrificed. So it's a matter of, uh, of intelligence. You have to make the decision. Now remember, one point that we want to make very clear here is that they did that, they opposed that when they were already certain about each other. This is something very important that we would like to stress here to you today. They went ahead, Caroline said, this is what we want. No matter what people say, we're gonna make it work. And if you believe it, as she said, go ahead and do it. Don't let anyone interrupt. Yes, but they did that on, on some very good Grounds. ground, foundation, which they learned uh, some time attending the seminars and, and they applied to, the, to, the, to their lives. It, they, it, it took them three years to get to know each other, three years, questioning, probing, seeing each other seeing in each different other. situations. Exactly. Getting to know each other very well. So that laid the foundation for the decision. So their decision wasn't based on third parties, uh, um, you know, um, I don't know, views, information yeah. or views, but based on their own conclusions. And I think that's very important that, you know, we, we are different from other couples. Each couple is different. So we have our own dynamic, mm -hmm. culture or not. We now are a new family, you're forming a new family. So I had one dynamic with my family, with my parents. You had a dynamic in your house. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that now I, I have to bring that dynamic into our marriage and you have to do the same. And, we have and, to create our own. And live somebody else's life or, or you know, live based on someone else's expectation. So um, I believe this is the lesson for today. We'd like to thank Nathan and Caroline for their story. I believe it helped a lot of people. And um, this is the end of our program. We hope you have enjoyed. See you next time. Bye-bye. If you have a question about relationships, love life in general, send your question to Questions at Love Talk TV. Sorry. <laughs> when culture and love clash, it can not, it, it doesn't only clash, but it causes a huge accident and destroys many people's expectations when it comes to love life. That's right. But before, we are going to go to a very important segment of the show. Let's go for Dear Love Talk. I don't know, what do you think? Let's just wobble. I knew it. It's a, it's a code. Uh -huh. That's why I ask if... Yeah. Welcome to the love talk... Blah, blah, blah. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the love talk. Do you know? No, no, no. More energy, Jenny. More energy. Where we confront myths and misinformation when it comes to relationships. When couples... It's... <laughs> when or where? Couples. 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 <laughs> Energy. <laughs> energy, I'm telling you, Carlos. Energy, Carlos. <laughs> At a certain point, their relationship, their love towards each other clashed with cultures. Oh, it's mine. Oops. Can we just get from there, Jenny? Welcome to the Love Talk. And today's topic is when love and culture clash. And right now, we're going to watch the story of Nathan and Caroline. They went through um, a huge clash within their relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, but things turned around and, you know, sorry, that's not what I want to say. <laughs> Let's go again. And um, this is the end of our program. We hope you have enjoyed. See you next time. Bye-bye. If 
Okay, bye. I didn't say bye. Sorry, I was a little bit lost. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all for today's Love Talk show. Be sure to tune in next week to learn more on how to love intelligently.